Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm Tim Tom. I'm the peat programme manager at Yorkshire Wildlife Trust, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to this session on peatland restoration economics, financing mechanisms and carbon. Um, funding for peatland restoration is going through a period of change, and there is an increasing interest from and role for the private finance sector to play a major part in delivering the step change we need. Um, and this session speakers are all at the forefront of helping to make that happen in, in a variety of different ways. Um, so before I introduce the speakers, uh, for the Q&A session later, there are a couple of issues which we may or may not wish to explore. Um, our focus on carbon markets to date has been on the emissions reduction benefits of restoration of damaged peatlands, but what about the sequestration potential of peatlands in better condition? And how do we maximise opportunities to combine public and private finance, including looking beyond carbon to include other ecosystem services? So maybe give some thought to that in, the, in some of your questions. So without further ado, our first speaker today is Phil Carson, who is the Senior Policy Officer with the RSPB, where he has worked for over eight years in several roles, spanning working directly on reserves, agricultural land management advice and land use policy. Recently, his work has focused on securing policy interventions to improve outcomes for nature and climate, including the design of uh, Northern Ireland's first peatland strategy. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Phil Carson, and I'm a senior policy officer with RSPB Northern Ireland. And I'm really excited to be speaking to you about a piece of research that we recently commissioned, which undertook two natural capital assessments of peatland sites in Northern Ireland. Um, and these are the Garan Pateau and Munchies Moss. And we're going to go through the results of those. But before we go into that, I just want to set a little bit of context around natural capital and why we undertook the work itself. So natural capital is defined as elements of nature that directly or indirectly produce value or benefits to people. And these include ecosystems, species, fresh water, land, minerals, the air and oceans, as well as natural processes and functions. Natural capital is essentially the stock of natural assets that the land provides. And this stock provides a wide range of ecosystem services that provide benefits for people. And these include provisioning services such as food, timber and water, regulating benefits such as water quality, climate regulation and pollination, and the cultural benefits associated with our land such as recreation, aesthetic experiences and health and well-being. And traditionally we've valued provisioning services probably more so than the regulating and cultural services that the land can provide. And this ultimately can result in the degradation of the land and this is particularly relevant to peatland sites. So we obviously have skin in the game when it comes to peatland restoration, but we wanted to determine what the economic benefits were of this work that we've already taken on some of the sites that we're working on, but also to determine what the business case would be for further restoration of these sites and others across the country. In terms of process, um, several steps were undertaken as part of the process. So we worked with Natural Capital Solutions, who are experts in the field of natural capital assessments, and they delivered this step-by-step um, -step process to determine the value of these two sites, and particularly the value of restoration. So it worked to assess the natural capital assets on the site by producing an asset register to determine the physical flow of benefits from the sites in the production of a physical flow account. The work then looked at the monetary value of those benefits with a monetary flow account. We also looked at calculating the cost of restoring the assets through a restoration cost account. And then finally, we worked to produce a cash flow account over 50 years to compare how those costs and benefits would be accrued at the sites and compare them against each other. And this took the form of investment appraisal. And these were based on scenarios of before and after restoration, which also helped to determine the winners and losers associated with the work. So I'm just going to move on to um, the first site and what we find there. So the Garan Plateau in County Antrim is the largest area of intact blanket blog in Northern Ireland. And this peatland supports a number of rare notable plant and animal species, including breeding hen harrier, merlin, curlew, and a number of rare plants, including marsh saxifrage and bog orchid. And these species have all experienced significant declines in Northern Ireland over recent years. So this site is really important for nature, but we also wanted to determine what other benefits it provides as well. So in terms of the site and the, the initial scenario, so the baseline scenario, we assumed that to be 2010. And this was um, 
at a point in time when the site was largely in unfavorable condition. So 95% of the site was deemed to be unfavorable. But what we wanted to do was to try and determine what the value of restoration since that point in time was. So there's been significant amount of work undertaken by Northern Ireland Water in partnership with ourselves to um, reduce grazing pressure around the site, but also to um, block a large network of drains and restore the site's hydrology. And what we found through this process is that the condition of the site is improving and it's improved quite significantly in a short period of time. So what we've seen from a site that was largely in unfavourable condition, a move along that recovery curve to um, favourable condition status or unfavourable recovering. And that in itself provides ecosystem benefits and can deliver economic benefits to society as well. So moving on to the results associated with Garn, and they're pretty impressive. So in the space of um, the 50 year scenario we're looking at, the benefits of restoration significantly outweigh the costs. So over that time frame, around 50 million pounds worth of benefits would be um, achieved compared to costs of around 13 million pounds, um, delivering a net benefit of nearly 40 million and um, a cost benefit ratio of around one pound um, delivering in restoration, delivering around three pound 91 in benefits. And these are in a range of different areas. So for example, in terms of water services, we would see an increase in flood mitigation in the wider catchment. We would also see a reduction in, in erosion um, as a result of more favourable land management. But by far and away, the largest benefits that are being accrued as a result of restoration are in terms of carbon. So we see the site moving from a net um, emitter of carbon in 2010 um, to moving towards um, reducing those emissions by 2016 as a result of the restoration that's taking place to then moving to a scenario in 2045 where the site is a net sink, which is delivering huge economic benefits. Obviously, this um, has been predicated on the point um, of uh, future carbon prices, and uh, the researchers at Natural Capital Solutions used um, the UK government non-traded carbon price um, per tonne in 2021, which is, has led to those figures. But even so, this is a realistic kind of assumption in terms of what the price for carbon will be paid in the future and demonstrates those benefits. In terms of other benefits as well, what we've seen through the restoration or would see through the restoration is that this would actually lead to an increase in jobs. So we would see an increase in jobs, not only on the site itself, but also in the wider economy. And particularly if agricultural um, land managers are used in, or are brought along in the process of restoration, although agricultural production would decline, we wouldn't see a net loss in jobs in terms of land management um, and, and farmers would actually be rewarded for that work. Moving on from, from Garen, um, look, we're now looking at the, the second site that we undertook a natural capital assessment of, and it's a lot smaller. Um, it's a lowland peaten site, again in County Antrim, called Munchies Moss, and it's about one mile west of Loch Ney, and it consists of a range of different habitats, so it's a mosaic of peat ramparts, trenches, pools and drains, and it's interspersed with grassland and wet woodland along with tall hedgerows. And again, similarly to Garn, it's a really important place for nature, supporting a range of different species. And most notable amongst these is the marsh fritillary butterfly. And um, this site is a major stronghold in Northern Ireland for this species, but also supports other species, including Irish damsel fry, fly, um, water beetles, and, and a range of others. So it's been designated as an SSI and a special area of conservation, um, the latter of which is particularly for the marsh fritillary butterfly. In terms of management for Munchies Moss and um, undertaking interventions to move the site into uh, full recovery, um, those involve a range of different land management activities, but the main ones would be removal of scrub, um, removal of some of the coniferous woodland around the site and some of the young broadleaf woodland as well. Um, interventions in terms of grazing and also ditch clearance to keep the waterways open for those invertebrates on the site. In terms of peat and restoration, the raised bog, which is present on the site, is not restored under this restoration scenario because this would change the hydrology of the site and would actually impact upon the marsh fertility, which is reliant on uh, Devil's Bit Scabious um, as a food plant, which would be um, impacted by rewetting of the site. One of the other interventions as well was the installation of a boardwalk and car park to provide greater public access to the site for people in the area.
So what did we find for Munchies Moss? Well, essentially we found that, again, restoration of this peatland habitat makes good economic sense. Um, but there's quite a lot of differences in comparison to, to Garen. So Munchies remains a net emitter of carbon, and that's primarily due to not restoring the area raised bog um, because of marsh fertility and butterfly. So there is a reduction in carbon emissions, but not to that full extent. And I think this demonstrates um, sometimes the weighing up of objectives at a site level. Um, this is a hugely important site for a species that is hardly found anywhere in Northern Ireland. So biodiversity in this context takes priority. Um, other benefits that are delivered on the site, we see an increase in recreational activity and people visiting the site, and this results in significant economic benefits um, per year in terms of um, visitor numbers and also um, health and wellbeing benefits as well. In terms of the actual headline figures, um, the benefits of restoration are actually less than the cost of the work itself. So for every one pound invested, it results around in around 0.89 pounds worth of benefits. However, the assessment does not attempt to value the biodiversity benefits, which, which are additional to this. So these are covered partially by agri-environment payments, but these assessments cannot quantify the full benefits of biodiversity. So rather than looking at it in terms of a loss, we can look at it in terms of what we deliver for biodiversity here almost covers its costs and we get a whole range of other benefits in terms of carbon and recreation as well. All in all, then what does this work tell us? Um, first and foremost, I think it demonstrates that investing in peatland restoration um, not only makes sense for climate, for biodiversity, for water quality, for people, but it also makes really strong economic sense as well. And we have a growing opportunity for peatland restoration to deliver these major public benefits in Northern Ireland. And we're in the process of developing policies, which hopefully will be able to instill a process in which the vast majority of peatlands in Northern Ireland are restored into good condition. Um, but this is, a, this is predicated on the right policies being put in place, along with long term funding to make this a reality. We, we can't afford to wait. We need to restore all of our peatlands and we need to do that with, with purpose and clarity and with urgency. And this isn't just in relation to peatland policy. We need agriculture policy to play a key role here, helping farmers to restore peatlands and involving them in the process and rewarding them for it. And again, we need to look at opportunities for private finance um, of peatland restoration in Northern Ireland, which can also play an important role in rolling this out further. So we really hope that this work helps to stimulate the discussion in terms of peatland restoration across the country, provides robust evidence to ensure that it makes good business sense and can deliver wide benefits, and essentially instills what we need to do to turn the situation around, um, around our peatlands. So that's a very quick run through of the work and the results and I suppose the implications for policy and what we want it to achieve. So thank you so much for listening to me to today and um, for any further information, please do um, click on the link above to read the full report um, and, and the recommendations within that. And for any further information, please feel free to contact myself, my email's there um, below, or to talk to uh, Dr. Jim Riquet um, from Natural Capital Solutions, who did a great job in terms of pulling all of the, the work together and, and the report itself, um, which, is, which is a fantastic piece of work. And finally, I'd just like to say thank you to um, the Department of Agriculture Environment and Rural Affairs in Northern Ireland who helped to fund this work and we hope it will make a, a really important contribution to the discussion around Putin restoration over here. Thank you. So thank you Phil for some uh, very important insights and some lessons to learn from, from Northern Ireland. Um, really good stuff there. So our next speaker is Andrew Stimson, who has worked on peatlands for around 10 years, firstly in research at Manchester University, and now with the North Pennines AOMB partnership, organising restoration works and monitoring, and crucially for this session, actually working to develop uh, peatland code sites across the North Pennines um, and other great North Bog areas. He's also helping us out in Yorkshire Peat Partnership with uh, dealing with some of the peatland code work as well. This presentation is about how we use the peatland code methodology to assess greenhouse gas emission reductions associated with peatland restoration works. 
And this is to allow us to work out how much carbon could be sold to Peatland Co buyers to raise private finance for Peatland restoration. Now the Peatland Code has been developed in collaboration with scientists to best reflect the current knowledge on emissions from peatlands in, in varying states of health. All sites are subject to independent validation and monitoring to ensure emission reduction estimates are a fair reflection of site condition both before and after restoration. And in our site assessment, we first check peak depth and then calculate the emission savings associated with restoration. So a peak depth survey needs to be carried out on all potential peatland code sites. Peak depth must be surveyed at least every 100 metres across a site. And you can do that um, and create a, a grid on a GIS system to, to help create those points for you. And the, the minimum uh, depth criteria assumes one centimetre loss per year. And that's to ensure that some peak would remain at the end of the project duration, even if no restoration took place. And the, the pictures here show myself and a, a colleague with a, with a set of peat rods. Um, blanket peat can be quite deep, but, but typically probably more within a range of one to three metres. Under the, the code methodology, saved emissions can be used to access carbon funding where actively eroding or drained areas are improved to the, the next category. And of these two, uh, actively eroding areas, so that's the, the top three in this list, are associated with the, with the greatest carbon savings, and that's at over three times um, greater than restorate, hydrological restoration of drained areas, which you can see below that. And to calculate your total carbon savings, it's necessary to work out the total area affected by both bare peat and hydrological restoration. I'll talk more about these on the, the next two slides. Now the aim of, of bare peat restoration is to protect exposed peat from further erosion through revegetation. Um, in, in the North Pennines, we combine a, a sphagnum rich brash with a mixture of lime, seed and fertiliser to, to both stabilise the peat and provide a growing medium for moorland species. And in some cases, we also add in um, sphagnum or cotton grass plug plants. The aim of hydrological restoration is to block drainage features um, and reprofile edges in order to, to raise the water table in, in nearby peat. And when, when you actually calculate this, it's done in a slightly different way because um, the, the effect has been assessed to, to be up to 30 metres away from a a restored um, 
feature. So, so you, you calculate the line for restoration and then draw some, some buffers around it. So in the North Pennines, we block erosion gullies using stone, wood or coir dams, you can see in the top left. And artificial drains in the top right here, usually with, with peat dams. And then we use diggers to reprofile steep hag edges to a, a gentler surface. So I'm just going to go through two examples of um, carbon calculations. The first here is Hartley Common, which is an area of bare peat and hagging gully erosion. And the, the bare peat areas to undergo restoration are shown here in blue. And the, the hags and gullies with hydrological interventions and the associated buffer are in yellow. Now the, the higher emission savings areas take priority so that the blue is um, over the top of the yellow areas. And in this case, we look at the overall figures, the, the actively eroding areas undergoing restoration account for three quarters of the overall carbon saving. Second example from uh, Lane and in Wales. This site has now been, been validated under the Peatland Code. Now here, hydrological restoration very much dominates with, with drained areas associated with the, the buffers you can see on the map covering 60% of the site. Now the overall emissions are greater than the previous site, but less in proportion to the overall site area as, as the opposite applies here. And three quarters of the reductions come from restoring drained areas with that much lower carbon saving associated. So before I finish, we'll just briefly consider mapping in a little bit more detail. Now, aerial imagery is very useful, whether that's satellite or drone images to, to assess uh, these features. And you can, you can look at your bare peat areas, which is on the, on the top here. Uh, you can either trace by hand or you can use a um, automated classifier to, to for the computer to tell you which areas are a bare peat. And then your, your linear features, again, you can trace um, along features over the top of an image and use GIS to create your, your buffers for you. OK, so that was a quick summary of how to calculate those um, greenhouse gas emissions for your Peatland Code sites. And we've looked at why peat depth is important and the, the carbon savings associated with, with different restoration types. So I haven't explored the finances of the Peatland Code here. But most projects are likely to be a mixture of both public and private finance. And the amount of private finance you'll be able to raise will depend very much on carbon prices. OK, thank you. Thank you to Andrew for helping us to understand some of the issues in uh, getting the peatland code sites kind of quantified and underway, sometimes 
quite complex to do. Um, there's a few questions coming in, um, so uh, I'm making them live as they come in. So please remember to to vote, uh, to like for you, the, your favourite questions, because we won't be able to cover them all, and I'll take the ones that uh, at the top of the list. So uh, please please start doing that as well. Um, our next speaker is uh, Rene Kirkfleet Hermans, who is the Peatland Code Coordinator for the IUCN UK Peatland Programme. Uh, for her PhD at Stirling University, she worked on the impact of forest to, to bog restoration on greenhouse gas fluxes. And after this, she worked on a policy review for climate exchange on the climate benefits of uh, forest to bog restoration on deep peat. And then for the Landscapes as Carbon Sinks project at Edinburgh University, where she built a good foundation knowledge of carbon markets. My name is Fanny kirkley Hermans, and I'm the Peatland Code Coordinator. Um, today I'll give you an overview of the planned developments of the codes and then we'll also touch upon um, what it takes to develop our codes in general. So first of all, the Peatland Code, what is it? So it's a project developed and managed by the IUCN UK Peatland Programme. Um, it's a voluntary certification standard to attract private funding for peatland restoration projects in exchange for climate benefits by providing assurance to buyers. So it's a UK-based standard for UK-based projects and um, companies that want to buy these credits uh, need to be up for their UK-based emissions. It's about emission reductions via peatland restoration. Um, it does not account for carbon stored in the peatland. And there are a number of eligibility criteria and a number of legal and financial tests. So developing of the code was quite a long process. So it took over three years to develop the Peatland Code. Um, it is rigorous and it's very much up and running now. So at the last conference, so last December last year, we had 24 projects registered and we now have 39. So we're still steadily increasing our um, number of projects. Um, and we've got seven validated projects at the moment. So the total area of registered projects at the moment is almost 6,000 hectares. And we've got um, almost uh, 151,000 tonnes of CO2 um, equivalent in reductions of the validated project lengths. So that's just the validated projects, the seven validated projects. Um, we work closely with the Woodland Carbon Code um, and we've got, we've created a UK land carbon registry at the end of last year on ISS market. That's now fully up and running. Um, and we've got, so all, all steps of a project go through all the steps of the Beatland code on the map, on the registry. And also the units are issued there, um, transferred and retired, um, all happens on ISS markets registry. So the code um, is very much um, developing. So, and I think that we'll always need to develop. So at the moment, um, so the code actually, Peatland Code follows um, the pathway set by the Woodland Carbon Code. So we are now also working towards achieving UCAS approval and we're hoping to um, achieve that by the end of this year. Um, that will result in uh, version 1.2 of the code. Um, and it will mainly be a tightening of language at that stage and, and clearer guidance. So not much of the content of the code is, is likely to change at that point. Um, so UCAS will assess the conformity to Peatland Code against the international standard for validating and verifying environmental information. That's ISO 14065. And also against the international standard for greenhouse gas accounting and reporting. So ISO 14064. Once the code itself attains um, UCAS approval, we will then seek that our certification bodies also work towards achieving UCAS certification. So another update of the code, which is, is a bigger one. So we always make sure, or we, we always try to make sure that the PLM code adopts the latest government science with regards to greenhouse gas data. So since the release of the base data in 2018, we have commissioned, we now have commissioned a piece of work through CH and DEFA about how to align the base greenhouse gas reporting categories for peatlands with those of the peatland code. 
And unfortunately, that's not just a simple read across since the categories do not actually align. So the scientists will update emission factors for the code to the latest uh, scientific evidence and bring them also into line with the data used in the UK government's greenhouse gas accounting. Further, they will also look at which other condition categories can be added, and we're hopeful to expand the eligibility of the peatland code to also include fan peatlands at that point. So this is expected to be a full version 2 update where the contents of the code is, is likely going to change. Um, and we're expecting that in early 2022. So overcoming barriers. So one of the, the key barriers that's still there, unfortunately, is um, landowner concern about making enough money if there's a risk of losing agricultural subsidy by rebetting. So one of the solutions for that is combine grants with the code. So the code allows up to 85% of the total project cost to be um, funded publicly. So that's happening with a lot of our projects. So we work closely with Nature Scott and Natural England to make sure that the grant schemes and the code work well together. Um, further, what would really help is firm assurance from government that agricultural support will apply to recovering and healthy peatlands would, would be a massive help as well. So just trying to get people more up to speed with the code. So I am doing a lot of training for our partners at the moment. Um, and if there's anyone, anyone interested in people code training, please, please do get in touch. And I'm also working on landowner, further landowner engagement. So more in general um, about carbon markets, ecosystem service markets, sorry. Um, so what do you need to create to create um, a code? So you, you need a quality standard. Um, you need really robust science and metrics. So that's that's the tricky bit to come by to, to actually to actually achieve. Um, you need independent validation and verification. Um, a transparent registry is really, really helpful where where you can see all projects registered, where you can see units that are being issued, sold, assigned, um, and, all, and, and, and retired, obviously. Um, you need to make sure that you meet the permanence rules and additionality rules. You um, may need a clear baseline for your projects. So the voluntary carbon market um, is, still, is still booming, like you probably all, all are aware of. So there's a lot of interest from buyers in our peat and um, carbon units, more than we have carbon units for at the moment. Um, and the UK government accepts uh, Woodland Carbon Code and Peatland Code verified carbon units as offsets for residual emissions. Um, so that's great. So that's in the environmental reporting guidelines, if anyone wants more information on that. So that's it from me. So if you want to find out more for anyone who wants more information on training um, or how to develop, deliver and or represent code projects, please just drop me an email um, and I'm always happy, happy to help. Thanks for listening. Thanks, Ronnie. Uh, really interesting to see how the linking of carbon through the Peatland Code and other ecosystem services might start to, to work um, a key area going forward, I think. Um, our next speaker is uh, Fred Worrell, who is a Professor of Environmental Chemistry in the Department of Earth Sciences at the University of Durham. His current peatland research includes the direct climate benefits of peatland restoration, the use of earth observation to monitor peatlands, enhanced carbon storage and the thermodynamic modeling of peat bogs. Um, and uh, he was destined to become a peatland scientist because his surname is the Anglo-Saxon for place of bog myrtle, Fred. Right. Thank you, Tim. Um, I'm broadcasting live um, and from uh, Reading Central Premier Inn. So, um, Thank you for that. Um, I'm going to be talking about a modelling exercise sponsored by Moors for the Future, looking at their um, More Life uh, 2020 uh, carbon uh, blanket bog restoration. Um, 
and those shots are actually some of Bleak Low, um, Bleak Low back in 2004 and uh, Penguin's Drift even then that actually was a, a cotton grass drift. It might be on the animations, it has frozen. Well, I'm not getting. All right, okay, there we go. It might just be a little slow on those animations, might jump about a bit. Um, the study deliverables um, estimate the current greenhouse gas emissions of more live 2020 project areas, estimate the emissions saved for the restoration works, um, recommend means of optimizing that greenhouse gas emissions that might not be the same as the current restoration works, project these forward under climate change. So we're using UK. Uh, CP scenarios, and then assess the economic value of that. The transitions are really, ah, they are catching up with themselves. It is a modeling exercise. So this is model world. This is not observe, observed world. I can now see what you're seeing on the screen. So I know when the transitions have happened. Um, it's a carbon flux model. It's not a peat accumulating model. So it works on contemporary fluxes. Um, and what it does is it modifies those according to the management. So we, we can have burning, vessel revegetation, um, gullies, cutting, drains, etc. Um, it works on a range of vegetations, so it will include differences between heather, sedges, grasses. It will have forests in it. You can have a small number of trees. The animation is just catching up. Um, the, um, and indeed, it, it will have things like bracken as well. There's a number of those in there now. There's about six or seven um, plant uh, groups. Yep, there's the animation just jumped forward all at once. I knew I shouldn't have put animation in. It does mean that we can look at the restoration techniques and model a number of them. Um, so, for example, we included um, brashing, we included heather cutting, uh, sphagnum planting, rhododendron clearing, um, conifer cutting. Now, I'm assuming these are little short um, conifers, never actually seen what they meant by conifer cutting. Um, we have a range of altitudes across the Peak District, and so we have to model across those range of altitudes. That's a big driver in the carbon budget. We can model managed burning, though we assumed in this case there was no managed burning. And for gully blocking, we did actually consider those both as a, um, an avoided loss, a perpetual sink, but also as a transitionary sink, the infilling of gullies. Um, let's just let the slide catch up. We have a number of um, monitored sites from Moors of the Future that allows us to calibrate the model. And then we can associate the, any restored area with a particular monitoring site, that both in terms of vegetation and in terms of the model fit. So we actually fitted the model to about nine of the calibration of the monitoring sites, and therefore we have nine sets of calibration. The, the most important calibration is actually the water table. This is an example from uh, the Penguin's Drift Control site. Um, the animation will catch up. Just to show you some of these and emphasize, particularly in the model and in the results, the difference between one is common results um, for the monitored sites, and this is for the greenhouse gas monitor um, monitoring of those sites. Notice the big difference. Red is bad. That's a source, um, and green is good. Most of the sites were more or less the same, except for the bare soil control, and the bare soil control was a big source of carbon. Well, that's eroding peat. That's particulates, um, but it's not such a big source of greenhouse gases because although the model copes with um, recycling POC particulates into the atmosphere. The difference here meant that it doesn't not all get recycled. And so there's a big difference between the sort of carbon and the greenhouse gases. And that actually is a story that came out throughout. It also meant with their monitoring sites for Moors the Future, their data meant we could actually look at some of the uncertainty in both the monitoring and the, um, the modeling to look at what uncertainty that would generate in terms of the results. So we compared the 2019 and 2020 vegetation surveys Reran all the models. Um, then we could look at see whether models were different. Um, down here we have the results 2020 versus 2019, the one to one line. And what we see is that actually the best fit line is not significantly different from the one to one line, but the maximum percentage error was around about four and a half percent. That's not all the uncertainty. That just gives us an idea of what the uncertainty was in some of our monitoring and some of the model runs. So it gives us a high degree of confidence. It's not a complete uncertainty analysis. So let's look at results. This is the immediate restoration benefits of the carbon budget. By immediate, I mean the year following restoration. There's a one-to-one -one line, and we want our, to have a benefit, we want it to be in the lower um, part of that line. That's where um, post-restoration is better 
than um, pre-restoration. And for most of the sites, that was the case. Not all. So that some of the sites are plotting above the one-to-one -one line. Most sites are down here. Yeah? And some sites have bigger changes than others. The average benefit was about 5.4 tonnes carbon per square kilometre per year. But not all sites had a positive benefit. Same is true for the um, greenhouse gas benefits, not quite the same, but um, similar. Most sites are in the right region. Some aren't, they're above the one-to-one -one line. And the average benefit was about 28 tonnes, giving us a total benefit of around 1.5 kilotons CO2 equivalent per year. We also looked at the trajectory under UKCP scenarios. That's the, tw uh, that's the um, previous set, not the 2018 set of UKCP scenarios, but we looked at those. And the important thing here is that we compared all the sites, so 69 sites we actually modelled, um, and we looked at the transition time. So we looked at red is if no intervention had occurred, green is, is post-restoration, so we have the counterfactual, and we compare to the sink source relationship. And what you see is that when we look at the carbon budget, by about 2050-ish, we see some of our sites beginning to transition over, and certainly by the 2080s, 2090s, that is the case. When we look at the greenhouse gas benefits, that's not the case. There's far more benefit of restoration in terms of the greenhouse gas. And this is due to the methane difference, that the soil CO2 uh, respiration, soil respiration is responding to temperature change, but the methane, the more powerful greenhouse gas, but the less proportion of the carbon budget is actually responding to hydrological change. And the UKCP scenarios are driving, uh, show climate change more in terms of temperature than in terms of hydrology. So methane is not changing so much where soil respiration is. And that gives us this difference between the carbon and the greenhouse gases. Looking at the total benefit over time, now here we see we're looking at the differences between the red, that's the counterfactual, and the green, which is the post-restoration over time. And the purple is the difference, yeah, the pre minus post, so the difference between the two. And here we see quite something I've not seen before, or maybe I've just not noticed it before when I've been doing these modeling exercises. And the carbon benefit begins to tail off, begins to flatten over time. I mean, this is out to 2080, but it begins to flatten. Whereas the greenhouse gas benefit doesn't, it actually accelerates with time. And again, this is this difference between what is responding to temperature and what is responding to hydrology. We can look at the economic value and we look to the traded, non-trended uh, traded prices. We did, this is based on net present value as well, but no restoration cost is included in here. And so we can see the trade, the tra uh, traded and the non-traded. And the estimate here is that we're getting up to about 12 million pounds worth of benefit over the long term. So to conclude, um, uh, yes, a, a benefit was achieved at 87% of sites, not all. The average benefit was around five tonne C, ton C, 28 tonnes CO2. There's a total benefit there. The interesting thing being the, green H, the GHG benefit accelerated with time, and there was a net present on non-traded value of around about 12 million. Um, one more slide here. Did it click? It didn't click. There it goes. Just to actually take some things forward, it would be better if we could target restoration works. Some works show little or no benefit. Now, some works are, are not everything is about carbon. That is true. Um, we could actually maximize the benefit by targeting our activities better and what activities better. The other thing is that, in fact, sink sizes, uh, the carbon mass has been preserved and made more resilient by these activities, but the sink sizes are relatively small. And if we are to meet some of the targets, then we'd actually have to look at enhanced formation techniques or enhanced carbon storage techniques. And I know that Chris is probably going to talk about that in a minute. Thank you. Great, thanks, Fred. Um, uh, getting all of this, all the numbers around uh, the emissions and uh, uh, sequestration from our peatlands is, is a really key issue for, for, for our carbon emission schemes going forward. Um, our next speaker is uh, Chris Evans, who um, modestly suggests that I introduce him as a peatland researcher at the UK Centre for ecology and hydrology on topics ranging from uh, field-based monitoring and research to inventory reporting, but I think we all know him a lot better than that. Um, uh, uh, he did mention, and just shows the, the calibre, um, that he was actually presenting to the House of Lords inquiry on nature-based solutions this morning. Um, so over to you, Chris. Thank you. Uh, no, I, I nearly missed that due to my shoddy timekeeping, so I'll try and do a bit better than that today. Um, so I'm going to talk about the um, greenhouse gas removal potential of peat restoration and I will 
hopefully. Um, explain what I'm on about as I go along. So I guess you're all fairly familiar with the whole net zero concept. Uh, and within that, the need for greenhouse gas removal. So virtually any model you run a future climate, if you want to keep global warming below, say, two degrees in this figure, uh, you, you are still going to have some fossil fuel emissions and greenhouse gas emissions in the future. So to balance those, you need some form of CO2 removal. Now, quite what that is, it is up for discussion. Um, and this is from the Royal Society report from a couple of years ago, just listing all the sort of technical potentials of different measures that could be applied in the UK. So sort of things to note from this, are that most of the ready for deployment methods are land-based, so things like planting trees, obviously, putting more carbon into agricultural soils um, and so on. Uh, if you want to really scale up in the future at the moment, the expectation is that that would require either bioenergy with carbon capture and storage or direct air capture with carbon storage as well. Um, to do that, you need to import a huge amount of biomass from North America or wherever. You can debate whether that's appropriate or not as a climate mitigation measure. Um, and the real take home from this is that in that report, peat and restoration was, was assumed to make a really quite trivial uh, contribution to GGR. And that's really because of methane and the expectation that really, at the moment, we've got such damaged peatlands that we just need to reduce those emissions to something approaching zero and that anything beyond that would be a bit of a bonus. Um, so that's good, but could we do more? Um, so this is where that kind of perspective comes from. Well, not just this, but this is an example of a study which we published earlier this year collating uh, flux data. And what you can see here is this clear relationship between the maintenance depth and CO2 emissions on the left, methane in the middle. And if you add those two things together and allow for the global warming potential of methane, you, you basically can get to a point where you've got a very marginal uh, net climate benefit if you can absolutely optimise your water levels between 0 and 10 centimetres. But if anything other than that, you're looking at a net emission. Um, but I think we might be missing a trick here and I'll, I'll explain why. Um, so firstly, um, this is a nice Dutch cartoon of the evolution of lowland peat landscape. So they used to look like the, the bit with the horses up the top um, and following drainage, the land has gradually subsided. It's now far below river level, it's reliant on pump drainage. And if you think about that, that's a lot of missing carbon. Um, and to look at that another way, this, the photo at the back here is, is farm where we're working. Um, the bit that where the road goes uphill in the background is, is to get over the river, which is higher than the land. Uh, you've all seen the home post, I'm sure. Um, three, four metres of, of peat loss over a couple of hundred years. Um, and peat wastage is extensive in areas like the Fens. So what that means effectively is that there is a huge, what I've called empty box here of what used to be peat and now isn't. Um, and the, possibility, you know, the question is, could we actually try to refill that box? The visual at the bottom here is, is another nice illustration of that. It's the Somerset levels. Effectively, that blue area would like to be a lake <laughs> right now. And the only reason it's not is pump drainage. Um, so just as a conservative effort estimate, just based on approximate rates of peat wastage or extent of peat wastage and the extent of wasted peat, um, we reckon there's about 2,000 megatons of, of CO2 being released by those areas, which is enough to have raised atmospheric CO2 concentrations appreciably just from the UK, just from peat. Um, that's a huge loss per unit area, and effectively it's a huge vacant storage capacity, so something like a third of the carbon storage capacity of, of North Sea gas wells. And it's in a landscape that's intrinsically favorable to carbon capture and storage. Seems easier than pumping it under the North Sea to me. Okay. Uh, that's just the lowlands, a couple of examples from the uplands. Um, I should say that <laughs> we're not the first people to think of this. Um, so this is a study Bleak flow reconstructing the past landscape, looking at the erosional losses, how much carbon's been lost. And if you scale up broadly based on that, we're talking hundreds of megatons from the uplands as well. Uh, some other work that Andreas Heinemeyer and colleagues did uh, came up with much, much higher numbers in, in the gigatons. Uh, and that's through peat wastage and the fact that some areas, probably there is no peat anymore. So what we're mapping now as mineral soils might have been peat in the past. So with huge uncertainty on that, but clearly there's a big lost carbon store there as well. So we've managed to convince uh, UKRI to give us some money to see if we can turn the, turn the dial back the other way effectively. So it's 
It's called greenhouse gas removal demonstrators. Uh, it's working alongside people working on things like enhanced weathering, afforestation, biochar. Uh, we're going to see if we can put carbon back into peatlands, and we're going to do it at three sites. Start with one in a lowland area uh, in the Isle of Axome, uh, one in the South Pennines, and, and one in Mid Wales. And each of those sites has got different issues. So we've got wasted peat in the lowlands under agriculture. We've got a fairly typical heather-dominated blanket bog in the Pennines, and we've got a sort of failed agricultural improvement area in Mid Wales, which is no longer doing anything for anyone much. Uh, so this is the graph I showed before. Um, as far as maybe the light green dot, it has some basis in, in evidence. Um, if you could get the site fully wet and shut down the methane emission, you might get to that light green dot. And then the darker green dots are really in the realms of fantasy right now. But the, the question is, can we get there? Can we actually go beyond restoration and through things like suppressing methane emissions, enhancing productivity, potentially adding biochar um, and, and accelerating restoration in the uplands through things like sphagnum planting? Can we actually boost this or push this in the other direction? Uh, so I think I just said all of that. Um, but just to say also that we'll be looking at trying to develop practical, economically viable and socially acceptable routes to do this at scale. So that's really linking through to the other sort of parts of this session on how do we develop carbon markets and, and make this a viable proposition for the farmers. And we've got lots of partners we'll be talking to about this. Uh, but then thinking about this a bit more, I've, I've been wondering whether we're actually underestimating just the benefits of conventional restoration, as it were. Um, and this is really a modelling exercise and a thought exercise at the moment, but I'll just run through it briefly. And essentially, what we're doing at the moment is we're to do the inventory or the peatland code or any other assessment. We take our degraded site, we measure the emissions. They're obviously positive. Uh, we then consider our best case to be a natural site. Um, such as the one on the right. And we measure the fluxes again, and we assume that if we do really well with restoration, we'll get from one to the other. Uh, but you wouldn't do that with a forest. Uh, you wouldn't start with the grassland plant trees and then go and measure the carbon flux of an old growth mature oak wood and say, well, that's the best carbon sequestration we can ever achieve because then you haven't captured all of the carbon gain through the growth of the trees. Um, so conceptually, it's not right, because actually, if you've lost your acrotelm, you've lost your peat forming species, you've lost a lot of carbon, and there's the potential to put that back. Um, so is that realistic or not? Well, this is this is the UK flux power sites in our in our synthesis. Um, that's where we think that, well, that's where the core data show the long term rate of carbon accumulation is. So quite a few of these sites are already beating that. And the site that's beating it by the most is Morehouse, which is nobody's idea of a, of a pristine site as that as that photo illustrates. Um, so why is it doing that? Uh, well, talking to people like Richard Lindsay, uh, who sent me this photo, uh, it's probably to do with the fact that the site's actually recovering from the past damage. So here you can see the Kaluna is looking rather sad. Uh, there's some happy sphagnum growing through it and, and overgrowing it. And, and that's an indication that this site's actually re-establishing its functional acrotelm. And, and there's a lot of carbon in that acrotelm. So Richard described this as my kind of epiphany moment. Um, but anyway, um, I had a go at modeling this and it's, it's really a kind of two parameter model. It's just assuming that we've got a certain rate of carbon input through plant growth into a newly established peatland. So this is effectively taking, you know, to all intents and purposes, you start with a car park, uh, you then build a peatland on it. Uh, so the more knackered, the better in a way. Um, so that's a ballpark estimate of the MPP of a wetland. Uh, we assume it takes a while to get there. Um, I realise it's not a trivial process to get there, but that's the idea. And then we took a decomposition rate from Digibog, which is actually for aerobic decomposition, so it's quite conservative. And if you do that, this is the kind of CO2 removal that you predict. So it peaks in about 2030, so about 10 years after restoration. And it peaks at a pretty high value. If you think where the long-term peak accumulation rate is, it's down around one. Uh, and we're looking at potentially up to 10 tons of CO2 removal per hectare per year at the, the peak of that re restoration. So this is capturing that kind of transitional gain. And if you care about Paris targets and, and all of this, that transition really matters because this is the period of time where we really need to find negative emissions. Um, and obviously, as I said, the more degraded the site, potentially the bigger the theoretical transitional carbon gain. 
So how much highly degraded peat is there to restore? Well, we've got all of our lowland peat under grassland and cropland. We've got our peat extraction, um, industrial and domestic. We've got all those areas of bare peat. And then I asked Richard how much haplotelmic uh, blanket bog there was, and he asked lots of other people, and we got huge variability, but I went with 25% just as a sort of ballpark figure. Could be wildly wrong, um, but that's the general idea. And then we took all of the kind of scenarios that are already in the Committee uh, on Climate Change's sixth carbon budget and, and just ran it, and this is what you get. Um, so if you just look at the CO2 uptake, uh, it gets by 2050 with restoring all of pretty much all of those areas uh, to about seven megatons CO2 per year. Um, if you allow for the fact there will be some methane emission, this is just using tier two emission factors. Uh, it brings it down, but it certainly doesn't cancel it out. So we're still looking at around five. Um, if we get really optimistic and take some of the ideas we're talking about in the GGR project, what I've called accelerated peak formation, if we can actually carbon farm these systems, by which in model world, that just means ramping up and down the numbers, um, as you can see, you could get somewhere towards about 10 megatons. Now this is wildly untested. Um, the only testing I really did was to ask Andy Baird if it made any sense and he said he thought it might, which is good because he'd tell me if it didn't. Um, but these are big numbers. If we're thinking we've potentially got about 20 megatons of avoidable emissions from peatlands, um, another 10 of greenhouse gas removal would really help to make the case for peat restoration. And obviously, if you're talking to people in carbon markets, they're, they're looking for removals as well as, as other things. Um, so just to conclude, um, I've put a picture of washlands on the moment. That's the used washers at the back because I think I'm a bit obsessed with washlands at the moment. I think we need more of them. And I think that's an opportunity for building carbon sequestration into agricultural landscapes and flood regulation. But anyway, um, to conclude, um, if we're gonna hit net zero, we need significant GGR. We clearly need some land-based measures. If we do it just through planting trees, we've got to plant up an area bigger than, the, bigger than Wales, uh, which, you know, more trees is good, but it would be nice to have a bit of a mixed portfolio of measures. Uh, my take on it is that the potential of peat restoration has probably been underestimated. Um, that's partly our own fault for using near natural sites as our kind of restoration targets. I think we've probably missed that transitional benefit of restoration. Um, so theoretically, there's a lot of potential here, but um, it needs to be evidenced. Me making up a model doesn't really make it true. Um, we need flux towers, we need the measuring over sites that are undergoing these transitions. Uh, we need the restoration to work, looking at some of the photos earlier of some of the sites people are restoring. That's not trivial. That's really, really hard. Um, and, and at the end of this, you have to have a, something approaching a peat forming system for this to work. Uh, it needs to happen at a really big scale um, and it needs to happen in the most degraded areas. So that's it. Thank you. Thanks very much, Chris. Um, really interesting to... Uh see whether we can start extending our approach from avoided emissions to sequestration. So uh, a real challenge there to take forward. Um, our final speaker for this session is Dan Hurd, who is head of corporate finance at Triodos Bank and is leading the bank's work in nature-based investments, including the development of four demonstration projects around the UK funded by DEFRA, EA and the Esme Fairbairn uh, Foundation. Um, Dan has over 25 years experience as a lead advisor helping environmental and social sector clients raise capital for projects. Good afternoon everyone, my name is Dan Hurd, I'm Head of Corporate Finance Advisory Team at Trodos Bank. Uh, I'm just going to talk to you this afternoon about some uh, thoughts on how we might scale up peatland restoration uh, and the financing uh, of that. Uh, we're currently working on a number of pilot projects around the UK, one of which is uh, with more for the future in the Peak District uh, and looking to develop some quite innovative financing models to accelerate peat restoration. So I'll be covering that in this presentation as well. Um, I'm suggesting uh, on the face of it, there are three models for financing peat restoration. There may be more, but I think for the purpose of this presentation, focusing on these three could be quite useful. Um, number one on the left-hand side there is the current model which is the typical 100% publicly funded peat restoration model, either the EA or DEFRA, maybe one of the water companies funding a, a restoration project. So we might well call that the status quo. 
Um, with the advent of the Nature for Climate Fund, we're moving into the second uh, model here, which is uh, more of a blended finance type model. And it's a real big step forward, I think, because um, obviously public funding can be leveraged to some extent here. As I understand it, Nature for Climate Fund is uh, done on a match funding basis where the Nature for Climate Fund will put in 75% of the funding and they're, uh, they're looking for 25% from private sources. So that is a, a, a really good step forward. The introduction of private finance means that there needs to be some monetization of the carbon benefits of peat restoration. And that then brings into play um, increased use of the IUCN peatland code and engagement with corporates who want to uh, achieve net zero commitments. So this is a really good step forward. And I'm going to talk through how I think that model might work in practice. Um, the third one on the right hand side is a slightly different one, and it's uh, more a 100% private finance funded approach. But this is where peat restoration is part of a larger landscape uh, restoration scheme, probably centered around natural flood management. But it could involve tree planting, biodiversity improvements, um, and a whole host of natural flood management interventions as well, including rewetting of peat. So this is a, a model where they've got a lot more revenue from other ecosystem services, as well as the greenhouse gas reductions from peat restoration. And it allows peat to be uh, restored as part of a larger landscape scale project. Now, that doesn't mean to say that it's because it's 100 percent private funded. There's no public sector involvement there. But instead, we might be pushing the public sector to become a buyer of ecosystem services rather than necessarily funding the project up front through a grant. So um, moving on to the, uh, an example of this middle one here. Uh, this is a blended finance model using Nature for Climate Fund. At the moment, we're obviously everyone's in discovery grant mode with Nature for Climate Fund. But obviously that needs to move forward into actual projects which get delivered. And this is uh, an example of the way I think I see it. Um, if you've got a very forward thinking landowner who wants to uh, restore a large area of peatland, uh, make some money, but also um, you know, achieve an environmental improvement as well, this is how it could be done. So maybe the landowner might be the initiator of the project. Uh, they may do it themselves. They may establish a special purpose vehicle for this, but ostensibly they would uh, apply to Nature for Climate Fund for a restoration grant. Uh, and they might be uh, receive 75% there. The match funding might well come from an external investor, like a, maybe a bank or an, an investor. It may come from the landowner themselves if they're a large organization. So the 25% sort of comes from private sources. So you've got 100% of the funding for the restoration project. Um, the landowner would obviously select a restoration organization, depending on where they are in the country, and they would be commissioned to do the work as, as currently. If it was in the Peat District, for example, it might be more to the future, etc. So we've got a project there. Um, the landowner would, in most circumstances, I think, uh, look to accredit that project with IUCN Peatland Code um, because that opens the door to then monetizing the carbon. And probably the most challenging part of this whole little model is actually then finding a buyer of the peatland carbon uh, through use of the code. So on paper, you know, the, the uh, sale of the carbon would ostensibly repay and service that loan, whether that's external investor or, or, or repaying the landowner's initial equity. So the, the location of a buyer of peatland carbon, the establishment of a contract and a carbon price, uh, all under the um, accreditation of the peatland code is, is a crucial part of this as a sort of commercial model. Um, on paper, it would appear to work, wouldn't it, if you look at it like this. But if you're the landowner, there's quite a lot of work for you to do there to pull this scheme together. You've got to intermediate between lots of different parties. So actually, the uh, execution of this type of project is probably going to be uh, as challenging as putting it down on paper in principle. But nevertheless, that is, that is potential for use of Nature for Climate Fund investment. If I just move on now to the third one, which is um, the broader ecosystem services model. Um, what we have here is uh, an example, and this is the example we're working on with Malls of the Future, the pilot project funded by DEFRA, EA and Esme Fairburn Foundation. And it's more of a natural flood management based upland project. 
uh, of which peat restoration is a major part, but not the entire project. Um, and what we're looking to do here is establish a special purpose vehicle, which will probably be in the form of a community interest company, so a not-for-profit vehicle in the uh, particular upland catchment. Uh, we're going to be looking to uh, engage the landowners. We've identified a site and we're engaging the landowners. Now, they're like, those landowners are being offered really quite a, a good deal because we want, we want landowners to uh, adopt this restoration model early. Lots of landowners are sort of concerned about what's happening with elms and more prone to sitting on their hands with this sort of stuff. So we've got to offer them something quite attractive to get them to move on it. So what we're offering the landowners really is a license agreement for hosting and maintaining lots of natural flood management interventions, one of which is peat restoration. Um, and they'll have an annual revenue payment for hosting and maintaining those interventions. And that could be tree planting, peat rewetting, uh, building of hedgerows, leaky dams, uh, ponds, wetlands, etc. Um, there's also, as a result of all those interventions going in, there will be carbon generated from the tree planting, uh, greenhouse gas reductions from rewetting the peat, and biodiversity gain through the um, creation of ponds and wetlands and new hedgerows. Now, primarily those carbon and biodiversity benefits belong to the landowner, but as the kick is, or the SPV is providing all the finance, there needs to be a carbon and biodiversity share agreement with the landowner so that some of that revenue can come back to the kick. The kick itself will raise all the money from private investment. That's the real um, challenge that we're facing with these pilots is to see if we can fund these things through private investment. Um, and obviously more to the future will be engaged to actually deliver the uh, restoration and um, uh, contract and then have an ongoing role in monitoring um, the maintenance of it. But the crucial bit for all this to work is we need a revenue stream to repay that investment and pay those landowners a revenue stream for a number of years. So the real challenge here is identifying the ecosystem services and finding out which buyers uh, are available in the market to, to pay for those services. And can we create a large enough revenue stream here to make this whole thing work? That That is the real challenge of this project. Um, as I say, I'm, I work at Trodos. Our role is working very closely with Malls of the Future on this project. Our role really is, into, is helping Malls of the Future intermediate and find a, find a sort of win-win solution for all these various parties um, and ultimately raising the initial investment. So if we look at the, the crucial bit, which is the ecosystem services, uh, this is what we're thinking about. Uh, we're thinking about a stack of services. And what we know from one of our other pilot projects is that natural flood management has very, very high value in catchments, which are subject to increased flood risk. And um, so natural flood management will probably be the largest revenue stream. The buyers of natural flood management risk reduction are likely to be the environment agency uh, who may have assets in the catchment or obligations to flood flooded communities. It could be the water company who might have assets in the catchment, the insurance industry who regularly will pay out on flood events, regional flood and coastal committee through their standard um, sort of core obligations. Could be local businesses, could be the local authority who face the cost of cleaning up towns and villages in the catchment f following flooding. So NFM has high value and that is almost the anchor in the stack of ecosystem services. But obviously we are uh, delivering a, a landscape scale intervention. So there are other ecosystem services which can be monetized. The second one and uh, subject to this presentation really is the IUCN peatland code, the greenhouse gas emissions. And uh, in the MFFP project, we will be looking for a, a corporate to buy those um, peatland carbon uh, emission reductions. And, uh, and there are a number of co corporates around, a lot of financial services companies, other FTSE top 100 um, companies looking to uh, achieve net zero commitments. So there's real potential here to uh, monetize the um, carbon reductions. Water storage is another one where um, a number of large supermarkets and food service companies that have water use offset commitments. And there is a measure called replenish, which has been established by Coca-Cola and the World Wildlife Fund, which is quite interesting. So we can maybe monetize water storage by selling that to a large corporate. We have a woodland carbon code in the tree planting that could also be sold, possible water quality improvements to the local water company, biodiversity net gain, um, 
which could be sold to the local authority through use of net gain receipts. Environment bill obviously just going through the House of Commons at the moment. And then there's a non-monetizable community benefits through this whole project of involving people in volunteering, tree planting, etc. Um, health and societal benefits, reduced flood risk being a principal sort of mental health benefit of a scheme like this. So just a reminder, really, the peatland carbon, tree carbon and biodiversity ostensibly belong to the landowner. So we do need to come up with a revenue share agreement because um, those revenue streams are needed by the kick to repay the initial investment. But my final slide really is just a couple of thoughts on what might be needed to uh, scale up peat restoration. And I would say the first one really, no matter how you look at it, we need to engage landowners um, and prove to them and potentially the finance sector that there is an attractive return on investment in this model, that the value of um, carbon reduction, emission reduction uh, can achieve a return on investment for that 25% private finance. So I'm really keen to sort of uh, work with landowners and see if we can get some demonstration schemes available so we can get Nature for Climate really, really working. I think it's a great opportunity as well, obviously, through this conference and some of the pilot projects to raise the profile of the peatland code, establish a price for um, peatland carbon. We know there's lots of large corporates looking to meet net zero commitments. They don't all want to go through woodland carbon code. So I think peatland's got quite an interesting and distinct opportunity at the moment. But we need some actual projects to put to these um, these corporates. And then Nature for Climate Fund as well. At the moment, it's great. It's 75 percent. It's match funded. But I th I'd like to see a special allocation from the Nature for Climate Fund to support some of the broader ecosystem services models like uh, the one on the previous slide um, and uh, because those are potentially very good value for the taxpayer because we're bringing so many new revenue streams and private sector players to the table so it would be great for Nature for Climate to have a little allocation to support that type of scheme as well as straight peatland restoration that's probably a conversation with DEFRA so I think all of these are needed to encourage early adoption of peat restoration and really accelerate uh, the whole sector Hope that's been interesting. I'm around for questions afterwards. Um, thank you very much. Great, thank you very much, Dan, for that uh, fascinating presentation from the investor perspective and kind of last presentation of the day, but really pretty much about why we're here, why this session's here to try and work out how to uh, tap into some of that, that, that investment. Um, so uh, that leads us neatly into our Q&A session. Um, there's been quite a few questions come in. Um, uh, some of the ones that came in later, uh, I haven't brought in because uh, we've probably got a lot to get through. We are running um, about 12 minutes over, but um, Sarah's given us permission to carry on if we want. So I'm going to propose to give us the, the full 20 minutes since there's plenty of, uh, of interest there. Um, but uh, so I hope you can can stay with us until till the end. I think this is quite an important uh, subject to talk about. So um, the first questions uh I think are around uh, very much around multiple benefits and going beyond just carbon uh, to look at uh, valuing and therefore marketing some of the other ecosystem services, which uh, the, the sort of latter presentations have, have, have looked at. So I'm going to start with uh, um, putting one forward to Renee on the Peatland Code. Um, and the question was, can you see the Peatland Code evolving to consider uh, carbon plus, um, essentially um, giving a monetary value to other measurable improvements, in this case, biodiversity, but I guess that could apply to a wider range of ecosystem services. Yes, very much so. So the Peatland Code is, is not called Peatland Carbon Code, and that's been intentional. So there's always been um, a view to also include other, other benefits that Peatland Restoration gives, but at the moment, carbon is or when it was, at least when the code was created, carbon was the only one that we could quantify that point. Um, so it's definitely on the agenda. Um, we have to do some more research about how we can stack these, how, how the additionality works. If we do include biodiversity, water quality, um, and maybe even other ones. Um, but yes, it is, it is something we are planning to look into, yes. Great, thank you. And then, uh kind of similar link to that is uh, a question about the the investors themselves which i think dan actually touched on in his presentation is uh, the fact that at the moment uh, most of the people approaching us seem to be focused on the the carbon side and the carbon credit side um 
a question about how we encourage those groups to engage, or those investors rather, to engage with the multiple benefits approach, um, uh, how we might start to take that forward. So, Dan, I wonder if you had some thoughts on that. Yeah, I think it's, it's important to distinguish uh, investors from buyers. Um, so buyers might well be large corporates looking to uh, engage with a restoration company um, and a particular site and obviously buy gre- uh, greenhouse gas reductions. I think the invest when we talk about investors, we should probably think more about the finance sector. So these are banks or uh, nature-based investment funds looking to actually provide risk capital um, maybe in conjunction with Nature for Climate funds, maybe that's the 25% match with Nature for Climate. And those are really finance companies looking to get a return on their investment. They will be less interested in the specific site and more probably interested in the commercial model. So I think it's quite useful to try and actually distinguish between your buyers and your investors. They aren't necessarily the same. Great, thank you. Um, and, and then I guess... Uh, uh, Another question is actually on the supplier side, and there was a couple of questions around this. And, you know, certainly in the the case of English uplands, the suppliers are all pretty much private landowners. Um, And uh, the question was um, around, are landowners currently interested in Peatland Code? And I guess if not, how can we encourage more of them um, to start start kind of going down this route? I think, um, Andrew, as you know, you're kind of on the front line of dealing with landowners. I don't know if you've got any thoughts on that. Yeah, certainly. We've had um, certainly been engaging with with, with two or three landowners on on the code. Um, And I think the main part of it is just really um encouraging and, and making sure that they've got confidence in the in the restoration work itself um because obviously when they sign up to the code they're making a they're making a kind of commitment that that there will be a reduction um the other side of it is the code does have a sort of built-in insurance buffer if you like so if you know, if it doesn't work in one place, there is a bit of contingency in there as well. So that, that's that's worth mentioning. But I, I think it's just a case of building up those relationships with the landowners through the restoration works and, and making it clear to them that, that this is another way that projects can be can be funded and and it can just help them in the in the longer term. Thank you. Um Philip, I don't know whether uh you, you had you know, i mean your work you must have been speaking to, to landowners as suppliers or whether you've got any other thoughts on that from a northern ireland perspective yeah i was i was just thinking about this really and i suppose there's the investment and the return on investment through private finance or public funds which is obviously hugely important but i think one of the other things to look at is the potential benefits to the i suppose the underlying profitability of the business too so we've modelled within the, that Garn scenario, it's heavily reliant on a reduction in grazing pressure and it's around 50% reduction in grazing pressure across the whole site to achieve that favourable condition. But there is evidence to show that that can actually provide benefits to the business through reduced input costs, for example, um, for a range of different variable costs as well, which can actually help profitability. And I think there's a role to kind of bring advice and, and knowledge in around that as well to kind of make that an attractive proposition. So to, to make your, your business more robust and resilient, and then also to have funding for, for public goods or private investment for those as well to kind of bring them together. Great, right, thank you. Rene, did you want to come in on, on that? Yeah, thanks. I just want I, I just wanted to add that the one thing that we see as well very much in the code is that landowners are, are also concerned that they will lose out on maybe future agro-environmental schemes if they do good now that they might not get any any um, payments for that um, on the new schemes. So obviously that's a really big barrier and it would be helpful if, if the other devolved countries follow suit to England's feed action plan where, where they have told said that that's not going to happen and it will still qualify. Um, yeah, so that's that's definitely something as well. Yeah, that's very encouraging um, to, to have that kind of political support um, to, that we, we can then take to the farmers when we're dealing with them on the front line as well. Uh, it's really useful. Okay, um, so uh, uh, does anybody else want to come in on, on those those uh, 
initial questions, just uh, any other further thoughts? Um, otherwise, I'll, I'll move on to some other questions. Okay, great. So uh, I th there's a, a, another set of questions which I think are around um, uh, the data and the, the the statistics we have and whether or not they're robust enough to actually really market carbon from peatlands. So um, I think, uh, if I may, I'll bring Chris in on that to, to start with and then perhaps Fred to follow. Uh, yeah, I got asked this by the House of Lords this morning, uh, along with Richard and Rebecca. Uh, I think our answer, I'll give the same answer now, which is that the numbers are as good as the data and the measurements we have. Um, a, a lot of the uncertainty at inventory level is really about the mapping um, and understanding what condition our peatlands are in. At a project level, that's less of a constraint because you really should know what peat you've got and what condition it's in at, at a site level. So then it's really about quality emission measurements we've got. And, and it's true that we, you know, there are whole quite important categories where the evidence base is thin. It's not non-existent, but you know, I'm a scientist. I'll always say we need more data, but I, I think we've got enough to make some fairly broad inferences about the role of water table, as I showed in the graph, about the fact that if you raise the water level, it'll improve. If you can get peat forming species back on, it's going to help. Sphagnum will probably help avoid too much methane, et cetera. Um, so yeah, if, if, you, if you look at what's out there in terms of some of the other things that get verified carbon credits, um, I think we're much more robust than some of those, actually. So I don't think there's too much to be ashamed of, but more data is always better. All right, thank you. Uh, Fred, do you want to come in on that? Uh, yeah, I completely agree with Chris. The only thing I would add is that um, if, if we sit around and wait for the data, what's the, you know, the consequences of waiting? Um, Yes, we should get some more data. Yes, we can potentially target that. But if we wait five, 10 years, is that really acceptable when there are, as Chris illustrated, some no regret strategies? Yeah, if you've got bare peat, if you've got gully, gullying, block them, you know, um, cover them with sphagnum. There are some things we should be doing now with where we can be doing good now. So my feeling is, yes, we can potentially advise on what data we need, what better data, you know, and I'm always careful to say that what I produce is model world, not real world. Um, but if we don't start, if we don't do things, if we wait, then it's only going to be worse when we do have to get around to it. Yeah. Um, Dan, can I ask um, from the, the investment and the buyer perspective, it, you know, is that uncertainty around the data a, a major problem at the moment? Is, or you know, is, is it not such a big issue for the, for, for the investment side of the, the equation? I don't think it is, because I think this is where buyers and investors will rely on uh, the peatland code. So if the site has been accredited by the peatland code, the assumption from the buyers and the investors will be that the data was sufficient to get that site accredited. I think that's just my view. Um, so I think, you know, the buyers, you've got a large corporate looking to achieve net zero, looking for, looking to achieve quite a high profile offset, or you've got a, a, an investment fund investing in a project. Um, I think they're focusing on different things. I think they will accept if that's presented as a project, which is peat and code accredited, that all the background data and research has been has been done. So I think it's that's that's where it sits really. Yeah. I don't know what Rene, Rene might have a view on that. But. Yeah, I was just going to ask Rene if you want to come in on that. Um, I have got a well, you, you're on, and Rene, I've got to uh, move on to the peat and code and. Uh, some questions around uh, particularly forest to bog but other other habitats and when when and if we're going to bring those into to the code and, and perhaps what the limitations are for doing that at the moment well yes yeah, so I'll, I'll first on on the the date the, the sorry the scientific data i think yeah completely agree with dan i think people and investors and buyers as long as we are i have to go through the accreditation they've got enough confidence in it and just to highlight at the moment the emission factors are are conservative, so we are. We've got small buffers around our drainage ditches. That's all to minimize, like to minimize the risk of overselling carbon units, obviously. Um, and yeah, on on other other conditions categories, um, like I said in my presentation, we've got Chris Evans <laughs> and others uh, at the moment looking at if we can um, exp expand condition categories, include fence as well. Um, we have to see what data. Um, is there what data is available so at the moment I can't say yes this is definitely going to go under the code and or this won't be um for a is unlikely to come under the code to the next version update um 
I think we don't have enough data yet, but Chris is probably more suited to answer that bit. Um, but yeah, it is something we've got still ambitions to, to get under the code in the future. Thank you. Um, Chris, you want to come in? in? Yeah. I'm not sure I can answer the Forest of Bogwan because I think that's the expertise of people like uh, Roxanne and Rebecca who, who do more work on that. Um, it is a challenge. I, I just wanted to come back to briefly uh, Fred's point about the kind of no regrets thing. I, I think there is a regrets thing if if we're too cautious. And I, when I talk to people in big corporates, they want verified carbon credits. They don't want corporate social responsibility feel good <laughs> numbers. <laughs> Uh, there's a kind of hard-nosed market out there and if, if we're too cautious the money in that market will go somewhere else and the other factor there I think is that if you're a if you're a landowner sitting on a degraded peatland you might look at that and think well that's not worth very much to me right now but in 20 years when there is a verified carbon scheme I might be able to flog it for quite a lot of money so that's actually a disincentive to restore now if you're not careful I think. Great thank you. Um, so there's an interesting question kind of uh, around, um, so at the moment, the the demand, uh, certainly as we're experiencing as peat practitioners for carbon credits, certainly way, vastly outstrips supply. Um, and yet, in my simplistic view of what markets are supposed to be about, that should mean that the price goes up and it's not. Um, so I just wondered what your thoughts on on why that is, how we get the price up. I mean, you know, our, our restoration work requires a lot more than than the price of carbon is going to allow at the moment. Um, so I, I, I throw that open to anybody really um, uh, to, to, to have a look at. If Rene, do you want to have a start? Yeah, happy, happy to start. So I think actually prices are going up <laughs> uh, of, uh, of the carbon units that we are now at the same, same level as woodlands carbon units. So we uh, between 10 and 20 pounds is what 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 peatland um, carbon units are selling for in like obviously offsets can be bought internationally you can buy carbon offsets if you want to for ATP internationally so three pounds like so if you compare actually where we are sitting with the price much higher so it's about the quality of of the of the code is about the, the people have more confidence in, in what we're doing here than than maybe in some places internationally where you can't go and check. Um, so I think I think it has a mixed match obviously indeed in, in how how expensive it is to restore peatlands and what you get for carbon. Um, but in just looking at the voluntary carbon market prices are definitely increasing. So yeah. <laughs> Okay, anybody else want to contribute on that? So I had a thought on this, Tim. Um, in the, you know, with, with a project, if you've got uh, Peatland code accreditation and you are looking to engage with buyers of the carbon, uh, but the, on the face of it, there are a lot of prospective buyers out there, a lot of large companies wanting to show interest in this area. So what is actually going to happen? You're going to somehow try and uh, sell to the highest bidder. So it is there is a there is a as yet untested sort of methodology of how the price for greenhouse gas reductions gets monetized. Mm. And I think that that's that's something that's going to come in in future. It's something that I think we might get a bit involved in. If you're a landowner and you were investing 25% alongside a nature for climate project, you would you would be wanting to get top dollar. Because you're signing up to a very, very long-term contract, probably with a corporate, and you're committing to peatland code, and you're committing to permanent landscape change. So that striking of that contract with the right corporate is absolutely vital, and, and it will be quite a, <laughs> quite a commercial arrangement, I would say. No matter whether it's the landowner doing it themselves or some advisor doing it through use of an SPV. So I think on, on the face of it, there seems to be a lot of demand for this, but uh, I think there maybe aren't too many transactions we can all point at, which actually have crystallised a price just yet. So I think we've probably all, all got to be careful not to underprice what we're doing just to get one or two projects completed. So yeah. look at it. Great, right, thank you. Any other comments on that one? No? Okay, I think I'm going to... Um, kind of wrap it wrap it up there um because we're, we're getting towards 20 past um so um thank you to the the speakers in this session uh for 
stimulated a great discussion. There's a lot more questions in the, the chat that I haven't been able to get to. I don't know whether we'll capture those and and uh, and deal with those at a later stage, but um, uh, hopefully we can try and do that. Um, so I'm just going to say uh, thank you to our speakers in this session, but also to uh, everybody uh, who has contributed today uh, to the to the conference. Another great day of of, of presentations and and discussion. Um, could I also encourage you to attend our film night in the P Peatland Pavilion from uh, 7.30 tonight. There's uh, a premiere from the Pennine Peat Life and a, a live Q&A with filmmakers. Um, I've, somebody suggested to me you might, might want to get there a little bit early just to navigate the, the pavilion if you've not done it before. Um, so, so please try and do that. Um, and uh, we start at 9.30 tomorrow. So uh, I'll see you all then. Thank you. <laughs>